There we go. She is blowing. The fish are biting. <laughs> oh yeah. It's not that fun. Cleaning the fish up here. <laughs> there we go. Look at that guy. <laughs> They're getting bigger. <laughs> Bigger gauge hook definitely is a must. When it comes to this, I don't like messing around. I like getting them in the boat. It's pretty, pretty small mouth. Beautiful way to start the morning. Thanks, Britta. <laughs> All right, guys, we just got out on the lake today and a uh, cold front hit um, a couple days ago and Water temps were around like that 70 degree mark and now she's dipped down into 64. We're in the later parts of the year now and these fish will eventually start eating and uh, you know, packing on the pounds for, for the fall, but it takes a little bit of time for that to happen. These fish, it's a little bit of a shock to the system. Um, you know, when water temps, at that first initial drop, I'm guessing we're gonna have to slow down and pick things apart today. So I'm gonna start here uh, at the council, this is where all the business happens to find the fish. Um, and we're gonna look for some rock today. That's kind of gonna be the key, I think, is finding these rock veins uh, and particularly the bigger boulders. So we're gonna go ahead, drop some dots and uh, spin back around and fish it. So if I zoom out here a little bit on the map, guys, you can see we're on a bunch of offshore flats. So the, the basin's around that 25 foot mark and then there's a whole bunch of offshore structure that tops out around that 12 to 15 foot mark. And so I'm just gonna kind of ride the edges. I'm gonna get on these steeper contours where I can tell that there's some, there's some depth change. And as you can see, we're kind of sliding up on the shallower water and we went from mud and now we're transitioning into a little bit of sand. When you're trying to find individual fish, you're you're gonna wanna be around that four mile an hour, but all I'm trying to do is find rock. And so the way that I have this boat set up, it's it's got two side imaging transducers on either side of the motor. And so that's just gonna give me the best readout and allow me to, you know, kind of scan around at a little bit faster pace, just cause there's not gonna be a blowout on either side of the motor. So uh, it's, it's nice to be able to cover a little bit more water versus, you know, going three, four miles an hour. It just allows me to pick apart these massive flats. And here's a bunch of really good looking rock right here. This is what we're looking for, guys. I'm gonna go ahead and drop a waypoint on that. Little rock icon. We're gonna keep going here. And I'm just gonna cover as much of this flat as possible. Dropping waypoints where I see good looking stuff. And then once I kind of got a lay of the land, we're gonna spin back around on it. get a, a day like today where the wind's blowing a little bit it makes things a little bit more difficult to use your electronics and so in live imaging in particular and so 360 is kind of my best friend today just because it's it's hard to navigate the boat and a lot of times when i'm getting around fish i'm just going to want to hit spot lock so having 360 going as well it just it gives me a, a good picture plus all these fish seem to be lined up on the rock spines. And so getting a lay of the, of the land on the bottom is, I, th I feel like that's the most essential part of, of fishing like this when you get conditions where it's a little bit choppy. There we go. That feels like a little bit better one. Yeah, not bad, not bad. Now we're on a little school here and so I'm gonna Go ahead and hit spot lock. It's nice about using a straight tail minnow presentation is I can do so many different things with that. I can cast it out, drop it right below the boat. Nice little small mouth. Ah, there we go. A little bit better one. 
there's a ton of bait out here. This is a Berkeley power switch. About as good as you can get for imitating, you know, whether it's smelt, Cisco, there's a bunch of shiners in this lake, perch, whatever it is. Just this little guy flashing around. That's what they're that's what they're feeding on. So not seeing a ton of fish right off the bat. Like I said, they're pretty pretty glued to the rocks, but once you hover that guy around them, they seem to show themselves. And that at least gives me a a feeling of whether there's fish around in the area or not. And that's just what's so unique about this style of bait. And it's getting a lot of popularity on all the tournament circuits is this the the versatility of it and being able to fish it so many different ways, straight, real, you know, a little bit of shake and bake or, you know, whatever you want to call it, dropping it straight below the boat. One thing that I've found to be a real important thing is your rod setup. Uh, I like a longer rod. I've messed around with it quite a bit. Uh, so this is a 7.4 medium, um, but I like a longer rod. I've gone all the way up to like a 7.9. Seven, seven for whatever reason, it seems like I can work the bait a little bit better and, and slow it down like I was talking about. I don't know if it's the length of the rod that just gives the line a little bit different of an angle coming back to the boat. But for whatever reason, having a long rod and being able to just hover it up in the air like that, it seems to slow the bait down and I can just work it a lot better. Throwing this on 15 pound braid to a 10 pound fluorocarbon leader and then a bigger arbored size reel, you know, 2,500, 3,000, that sort of deal. I like that just for line pickup and it seems like your drag only gets smoother the bigger size of reel that you go. Gussie's made a lot of money doing this exact tactic. Less is more in this situation. A lot of people think that no, you have to, you have to catch them out at 80 feet. No, you don't. A lot of fish will bite under the boat. You just have to know how to present your bait. A lot of times when you get it close to the boat, doing nothing is key. You think jiggling it here and trying to get them to bite or lifting it up like that would trigger a bite? No. You literally just, if you have a school of smallmouths come next to the boat, drop it down and don't do anything. Eat it, eat it. There we go. Oh, that's a big one. That's a big one. Nice. He followed all the way to the boat and you guys will kind of notice, I, I play with my drag a lot when I get fish next to the boat. You know, I can use the smoothest drag possible, but when, the, when, you, got a sh when you got a short amount of line out, I feel like it's pretty key to play your drag and, and give it some line manually if you have to. Hit spot lock here. There we go. Look at how he got that. I just watched that fish. He only ate it like 10 feet from the boat, but always taking a peek at your electronics, making sure that you stay in the strike zone for as long as possible. It's a nice fish. What I was talking about with that last fish catch and loosening your drag is I have this thing pretty cinched down. Most of the time I want to use a decent gauged size hook to really drive it home. So once I catch or once I hook into a fish right here, there's not a whole lot of line out. And so I'm going to give them the beans here. But a lot of times when you set the hook that hard, they're going to come straight up to the surface and then dig straight back down. I've seen it a million times. And so that's what I'm talking about is once you drive that hook home, loosen it off your drag or if you have to, because you know, you're, you're dealing with only a couple seconds here, manually giving them a little bit of line seems to help and not lose those fish or break off next to the boat.